So thanks so much everyone for making it out. You know, it's a rainy night, not ideal. Um, January tends to be a little breathless in New York as it is. And just from those of you I know in the room, I see such a mess on here. It's a privilege honor that you all decided to make this a priority. Um, I'm just going to give like a really quick backstory on why I was interested in this project, and then you was going to share how kind of our two interests converge into what we're doing with Not Alien now. Um, I write fiction, I'm very interested in narrative, um, and I've been observing that many of our neighbors who are longtime uh, village residents had these amazing stories to tell, and I knew people were documenting them, but it wasn't clear to me that that was happening in a systematic way, and so GBSHP was, I guess, the clear first place to reach out to them. They do have an oral history archive, as Chelsea mentioned. They really focus on uh, you know, the stories of people who came from the previous ways of immigration. And so we had already been talking about if there might have been, you know, might be some interesting overlap. Um, but before we had even launched this project, and I think in the back of Neither's mind, there had been a desire to find better ways to talk about immigration experiences. And so
said about immigration and about immigrants, um, and this really toxic, you know, what's passive for public discourse. And so, um, frankly, the project grew out of a hopeful moment, um, not entirely hopeful, but hopeful that we wouldn't be sitting here today with the political circumstance that we're in. Um, and so, I think there was an optimism fueling it. And what's been remarkable to me is how frequently um, it seems like the people we're talking with um, almost believe things about the United States um, that I don't see most um, you know, people who are born here really, in terms of like the opportunity and um, that you do have this chance to you know, build a better life. And, um, if you're willing to work hard, the door's open, right? And like again and again, the, that gets repeated. People comment that they never saw a race until they came to the United States. Um, and, you know, it's funny to see those things juxtaposed, but it, it, again and again, um, a couple of these key themes come up. So I think there's been a lot of learning for both of us, and probably especially for me, just, um, you know, listening and hearing people's stories and how radically different they are and then how they dovetail, especially because are just obliged to interact with this, again, monolithic system. Um, and so it doesn't matter your circumstance, you're kind of stuck dealing with it. Um, I thought it might be nice to hear just one short clip from um, an interview we did with uh, a friend who's a small business owner in the neighborhood. Um, can we do that? Or? Um, so we had to walk inside and then brought in basically that don't pay us at all. And I remember I was like making uh, trying to food delivery. So I made tips and then I used those tips to pay my tuition. At that time, per semester, I, I was paying about 2600 per semester for tuition. And it's very difficult. I remember like, I was so hungry um, in the in like between class, so basically like like every, almost every day. So we I spend like maybe two or three quarter to buy those like chips just to just to fill the stomach and then keep going. Yeah. And after a while, and then my father requires to to work more in the store, and I couldn't study anymore because I. Full time restaurant is like twelve hour, and then full time the the school I, I was like fifteen credit, so it's like full time, and I I didn't even have enough time to study, so I dropped out, and I dropped out absolutely. So uh, that was that uh, part I want to really go to get a like, degree or something, but. I I remember uh, the other thing is like I was thinking about to to join like, um, like U.S. Army, so I could uh, maybe like get a tuition stuff like that. I mean like the financial um, the yeah, yeah, the I guess it is yeah, right. So it's right. It's whatever it's called now. Yeah, to to support, but I I didn't know I was a legal until I took my passport uh -huh. and went to see those uh, recruiter. Um, sorry, we could, we could um, uh, recruit you. You need at least an eight number, so so that we know that uh, you are eligible right. to to enter this. So so then at that point that uh, okay, and then I realized that I, I was very. Uh, but you were I never you had no idea. I, you came yeah, as I, I, so, yeah, yeah, I can't um, realize it. Um, I mean, this is more me over. I didn't know. successful, runs a small business, that, you know, very busy, um, you know, uh, I didn't know, but I didn't know that he has a, a son, his family moved to Long Island for what he felt was better schools, um, but that, I guess people should go and listen, and it, you know, it was very hard to, um, to pick one, and I found myself wanting to share a lot of clips, but I think this was the one moment that, among so many, that, like, just me where I was sitting across from this person. It's just like, <laughs> you know, the, that confluence of factors that he's there wanting to join the army so he can put himself in college and then just 
discovering that that's like, um, it's just, you know, very moving. Um, so anyway, we, we recognize the boundaries of a narrative project, and we felt pretty strongly um, about trying to, after the election especially, trying to leverage any, you know, reach that we could generate um, to, to support the work of people who are more at the front line of, you know, the, these struggles, which is why we reached out to local and so thrilled to have Tony here tonight, um, and why we're especially excited that our friend Tony um, from Immigration Advocates Network slash Citizenship Works um, is going to say a little bit about what they're doing, so unless you have
don't have access to health care, you don't have um, you don't have access to a state ID. Uh, if you leave the country, um, there's a there's a bar, meaning there's a, you cannot enter the country back for ten years. Um, and so and so I had no choice. Well, I grew up here and I wanted to stay here. My friends were here, um, uh, and and so I decided, hey, what else am I going to do but go back to school? So uh, fortunately. Um, Oh, we have no access to financial aid. So everything, all the money that I got for education was out of my parents' hard work or my hard work. Um, and so I worked in restaurants, I did babysitting, I cleaned houses, whatever I had to do in order to make my tuition. Um, so uh, after that, um, I decided, I, I saw that after I graduated from with my master's degree, I still couldn't get a job. And that's when I got really angry, right? I got really angry because I said, how is it that I'm going to be here um, most of my life and I can't legally work? I can't do any of the things that I'm, I'm, my parents had always dreamed of me doing, right? They didn't come to this country to just watch me not do anything. So um, I decided to get, to, be, to become active in terms of like uh, immigration, uh, being an activist. So that means like going down and doing a sit-in or going out to Washington, D.C. or getting involved in an organization that advocates for immigrant rights. Um, and that's how uh, DACA came about. Um, if anybody, has anybody heard of DACA? Okay, most people have, but it's an executive <coughs> order that President Obama issued a few years ago. Um, giving individuals like myself uh, permission to for work authorization um, and protection from being deported. So um, that's what I have now is deferred action for childhood arrivals. So I'm now able to legally work. Uh, I'm now able to, um, uh, with permission with the government, I can leave the country. Um, and so that's been a big help in my life. Um, and I recently got married. Uh, which is, it had to happen one day, right? <laughs> so, uh, 14, I'll, I'll be eligible to apply. I, I've been applying for my green card. Um, but I didn't want to apply, I don't want to just get married for my green card because I could have done that a long time ago. I, there's something wrong with the immigration system if people, they're forced to be married, you know, in order to get a green card, even if you're not in love, right? There's something really wrong with that. Um, and so I didn't want to do it um, for that reason, um, and so and so that's why I became really dedicated to, to this issue because, believe it or not, my, my dad and my brother are U.S. citizens and me and my mother are undocumented. Um, it's, it's really, it's, it has to do with the judges and with the attorney that we had, and it's really complicated. Um, so, so fortunately, my mother recently, um, she became a permanent resident well, but it took us about 26 years to, to go down the path. Um, and there are many people like this. There are many individuals that you didn't know that, you know, your friend there was going through that situation. But people are living like that all around us. Um, and so now that, you know, we have this uh, president-elect that's coming in, and he's promised to to take away that one, right? Um, now he's like kind of changing his tune, but we don't know. So where does that leave everybody, um, especially individuals, you know, families, whole families that are together? Um, there are many situations that, that, that happen. So that's why that's why I'm involved in this, and that's why I'm very committed to this issue um, because it's it's not just about saving my family, but it's saving you know, New Yorkers, you know, people that are have lived here for 30 years, 50 years, even, and that haven't been able to adjust their status. Um, so I'm going to show you a little video of somebody who, because um, because I feel like the media uh, tends to tends to portray people who have an arrest and who are immigrants as completely bad criminals. And you'll hear this in the news media. And you've been hearing this throughout the last few months um, that uh, that Trump and even Obama that he wanted. Wants to report criminals. Okay, so, um, so Richard is somebody who I think is, is very important.
story because um, some people may not find sympathy in his story, uh, and he's some one individual that uh, uh, President Obama and and President Trump uh, considers to be a criminal, even though he's lived in the country since he was seven years old. Um, that's about over 50 years as he lived in the US, United States, um, and because of one like third degree. Um, uh, crime that he committed in 1983. Um, immigration came to his house one morning and took him from his family about three years ago. So, um, uh, and, and he went to jail. He paid for his crime. He, he paid for his crime, uh, but uh, but the, this is one individual who has a family who's affected, who has a whole community who's affected um, by, by him not being there. Um, they need him there in his family. So, I think it's important to tell my story, which I think many people can find sympathy, but also to tell his story where you know not many people may not find that sympathy in his story. Um, but it's important to kind of widen that that gap or that window for for individuals to become to, to get on a path to citizenship, um, and so that it's not as narrow for just for individuals like myself, you know. Um, so uh, and if Again, if um, if you want to volunteer with his case, um, we are very much open to to doing so. Uh, uh, and, and even if you can't volunteer, some of the things that you can do is is whatever happens in, in the future with any kind of policy change in immigration or anything that you know the next administration um, does uh, policy wise changes. It's important to to not kind of put it in the back seat, normalize. You know, like oh, it's it's just nothing's gonna happen, or or let's just let's see what happens next. I think I think it's very important to talk about it, even if it's amongst your friends, it's amongst your community to talk about what, what's going on, and not just uh, set it out to the side. If it doesn't affect me, then it doesn't matter. Um, it probably affects people that you may not know are being affected, uh, like you know your <laughs> your friend. Um, and then you, I see there's some questions that I'm gonna. I don't know when you'd like to get to questions. Um, can we uh, give Tony a little time to, to talk and then yeah. go on to questions for everybody? Yeah. Okay, so um, I think if, if, if that's, that's okay, I'm going to invite Tony uh, to come on up um, to say a few words about his program. Um, but thank you for your time. So that people who were living in fear before 
who had now just had their level of fear magnified to 100, had access to something that would allow them to try to figure out if there were any options for them. And so EMI is a, is a website that allows people to go through an interactive interview, and it will help them to at least find out if there are any possible options for them to uh, to remain in the country uh, either through some sort of application for a benefit or relief from removal. Um, so we worked with experts from around the country to develop this interview, the logic interview. And uh, it's not it's not something that will say, oh yes, you can apply for this thing, go ahead and fill out an application. It's just it gets enough information to at least tell you here are some options for you. You should go talk to an expert to make sure. But at the very least, people will be armed with more information so that when they do go talk to that expert, one, it keeps them from getting scammed because uh, a lot of uh, a lot of people out there actually tell uh, people in the immigrant community, oh yeah, you can apply for this thing, just give me three thousand dollars. You know. A couple months later, maybe a work permit comes in the mail, and they think, oh, great, that lawyer actually did the thing that they said they were going to do. But then a couple months later, uh, uh, you know, in order to show costs, and, you know, they, uh, uh, in order to show up an immigration court, shows up on your doorstep because that person applied for something that you actually aren't eligible for. But in the time that they're processing that, they notice give you a work permit. And so there are a lot of those scams going, um, going on in the community, and we were trying to build a tool that would allow people to, to, uh, to just know for sure these are some options, and then when they hear things that maybe didn't get surfaced, they might ask us some questions and say, well, actually, that doesn't sound right. So we have a learning center built in, but um, in addition to that, uh, to that interactive interview, we have a little bit of a bandwidth problem here, so <laughs> I'm not sure how much of it we'll be able to see. Um, but I mean, I think the main point in talking about this tool is to make sure whether or not this is something that might be directly useful to you, at least to try to get the word out, so that if you have people in your life or if you run into somebody who um, might benefit from understanding a little bit more about immigration options that they're uh, that are out there, they can go to this uh, website and, and see whether or not there's something there for them. We're also connected to a national uh, directory of nonprofit immigration uh, service providers. So once you go through the interview, or if you can just jump to find legal help directly, you can try to find local immigration service providers <coughs> in your area. And we work every year to make sure that that's an updated directory. Um, in addition to that, we have a lot of uh, articles, Know Your Rights articles. So for folks who maybe are already in some contact with immigration or um, face the possibility of that, there's uh, articles that help people prepare for those scenarios and understand what, um, what they can do to make sure that they're doing everything to protect their rights. So that's, that's Amy, and then um, we have a, another site called Citizenship Works that I won't get into uh, so much, but Citizenship Works is actually a tool to help people who are already law permanent residents take that last step to become U.S. citizens. Uh, the application is 22 pages. Um, I think that USCIS has mentioned making it even longer. Uh, it's probably more complicated than doing taxes. But the most important thing is that when you file for citizenship in the United States, it's the last contact you have with USCIS. So if you did something wrong, they're going to find out. So we use the same kind of principle and built an interview in that website that allows people to go through and fill out their form. But if they trigger any situation where it could lead to them getting into some kind of trouble, we actually flag the case and tell them to go contact a, um, an expert to help resolve those issues. Um, but, you know, I think right now, our biggest concern is, is people who are not even close to that final step and just trying to make sure that people who are living in fear um, arm themselves with some knowledge and some information so that 
they can uh, actually kind of take more control of their own, their own situation. Thank you. Okay, so uh, the program has been a little bit on the fly here uh, owing to weather. I think, did I see food arrive? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what I'd like to do simultaneously, anyone who's hungry should get food. Um, you know, I know some people paid in advance, but I think we have enough food that once those people go, everybody should go eat the food. It's amazing. Um, our, our friend Josh uh, runs a sustainable local uh, farm in Walnut City, and um, they provided the food. That's him in the overall campus. Um, at least he, he speculates that he may be more than a tenth generation farmer, but five generations are confirmed, so, and some third. Um, but I, I'm encouraging everybody to get food. Um, and then we'll also open up for questions 